morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 through 20. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will do away with both of them. However, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God raised up the Lord, and will also raise us up by his power. Don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body? So, should I take a part of Christ's body and make it a part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined with a prostitute is in one body with her? For scripture says, the two will become one flesh. But anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. The word of the Lord. We're in a series in which we're looking at some of the most controversial topics in our culture, things like gender, sexuality, marriage, abortion. And as we continue, um, I want to remind us of four goals that I have. The first goal is I want to slow down the conversation. Um, in some ways, this might sound weird, but I want to make the conversation more complicated. Um, I don't mean confused. The goal is clarity, but in order to seek clarity, we need to embrace the complexity of these topics. Second, I want to show respect for the many different viewpoints that are out there, both outside of Christianity, but also within Christianity. Because even Christians believe different things about some of these topics. So let's listen well to each other. Third, I want to be sensitive to the grief, trauma, and shame that are part of many people's stories in these conversations. Uh, the, having these conversations is like open heart surgery. It needs to be done, but we need to be really careful. And fourthly, um, we are embodied creatures. The, the, the biblical view of the human person is that we are not just bodies only. Neither are we souls with only a temporary body. The Bible says that we are a body-soul unity, and we want to account for our embodiedness in this world. So this week, we are starting to get into some of the more specific conversations in this series. And the first topic is sex. There's almost nothing in our world that is more intimate, vulnerable, and sacred than sex. And therefore, almost nothing that has the same kind of power to shape our inner sense of self, worth, and dignity than sex. That's why sexual assault is so particularly devastating in this world. This is a challenging conversation, and so we need to be very careful because there's so much shame and wreckage in so many of our lives. Um, so this is already a challenging conversation, but the culture wars make it even more challenging because we all have a frame for sex. A frame is a way of picturing something. We all have a way of picturing sex, whether we're aware of it or not, and we also have a way um, that a frame for how we believe other people picture sex. So for instance, uh, there's a picture of Christianity as being very rigid and repressive about sex. It says sex is bad, sex is dirty. We need to clamp down on our desires and, and run away from sex because sex is bad. Unfortunately, the source of that picture is Christians. <laughs> um, but that's a deeply distorted picture. What's a more biblical, truer picture of sex? 
Christopher West is a Catholic theologian who's written many helpful books on this topic. In one of his books, he tells this story. There once was a young couple who were madly in love. One night, they found a secluded garden where they could be alone to express their love for one another. Little did they know that this garden was on the property of the home of an aging priest. And when he heard the commotion, the priest went outside and walked up to the edge of the couple's blanket. When they saw him, they thought he was going to scold them. Instead, he looked up at the night sky and said, Tell me, what does what you are doing here have to do with the stars? He paused, then walked back inside and left them to ponder his question. What does what you are doing here have to do with the stars? That is a very different picture of sex. What is sex? What does it mean, if anything? What do we do with this incredibly powerful force in our lives? Christopher West frames his discussion of this uh, in three categories, desire, design, and destiny. And I can't improve on that. And by the way, when we look at this passage, that's exactly what Paul is showing us. If we really want to understand the true meaning of sex, we need to do three things, and they're all in this passage. We need to listen to our desires, honor our design, and live into our destiny. Desire, design, destiny. Let's take a look. First, we need to listen to our desires. At the beginning of this passage, Paul says, flee sexual immorality. This word sexual immorality is the Greek word porneia. This is where we get our word pornography. In this passage, Paul is talking about sex with a prostitute, but Paul uses the word porneia to talk about incest and also to talk about adultery. In other words, any sexual activity outside of marriage uh, is porneia, and Paul says, flee from it. Now, for us modern people, <laughs> this conjures up all the worst stereotypes of religion because we think of ourselves as sex positive, but the Bible is sex negative. And Paul ends up becoming this angry, truculent guy who's warning us away from sex, kind of like Gandalf on the bridge of Khazad Doom with a Balrog standing behind him saying, fly you fools. In fact, uh, Christopher West calls this picture of sex the starvation diet. It's really easy to think of uh, that the biblical picture of sex is saying that sex is bad, you need to run away from sexual desire. Friends, it's actually the opposite. Take a look here in this passage. Earlier, Paul says, uh, he's talking about, he says, don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For scripture says the two will become one flesh. Now, um, when he's talking about this, he's talking about at one level, he's just talking about physical union with another human being. And he's saying, don't have physical union with a prostitute or anyone else you're not married to. But is that all he's saying? You know, if the church's picture of sex is starvation diet, um, Christopher West says that our culture's picture of sex is fast food. In other words, sex is just a physical appetite. If, if you're hungry, you eat food. If you're thirsty, you drink water. If you're aroused, you have sex. That's our culture's picture of sex. And, and the only thing you really need to do if you're going to have sex with someone is just make sure that you have consent. In our culture, as long as you have consent, our culture says, go for it. Because sex is just a physical appetite like any other. So for instance, dating apps like Tinder uh, have hardwired this picture of sex into our imagination. For instance, here's a, one of their ads. It shows a picture of two hot young people climbing a fence. And it says, single does what single wants. The image here is, is of transgressing boundaries and um, tearing down taboos. It, our hookup culture says that, that you should be free to do whatever you want. It says go for it because sex is just a physical appetite like any other. The problem is that our desires are telling us that sex is far, far more than just that. For instance, I read an article a few years ago in the New York Times by a woman who met a guy on Tinder and hooked up with him a couple of times. Um, but this guy was different because... He didn't just ask for consent once. He asked for consent 
for every single thing he did. In fact, in the moment, the woman says it felt like overkill to her. But then the guy ghosted her, and she was devastated. Uh, and her roommates couldn't understand this. They asked her, why? And she said, well, because he kissed the inside of my arm, and that felt intimate. He asked for consent over and over again so that sex felt like a sacred act, and then he disappeared. And one of her roommates laughed at her and said, a sacred act? Girl, you sure don't treat it like that. And she thought about that. She realized something. And here's how she ends the essay. She says, a culture of consent should be a culture of care of seeing and honoring another's humanity. And if that's the goal, then consent doesn't work if we relegate it exclusively to the sexual realm. Our bodies are only one part of the complex constellation of who we are. To base our culture of consent on the body alone is to expect that caretaking involves only the physical. Now, I have no idea if this woman's a Christian uh, or anything, whether she believes about God, I have no idea, but do you hear what she's saying? Our culture says sex is only physical, but our desires are saying it's so much more, and the Bible is saying that's right. So for instance, look again at what Paul says here. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For scripture says the two will become one flesh. Now, what does one flesh mean? Whatever it means, it can't only mean physical union. Otherwise, Paul is saying, don't you know that if you're physically joined to someone, you're physically joined to someone? That doesn't make any sense. When Paul talks about one fleshness, he's quoting Genesis 2, which talks about the very first marriage. Here's what it says. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, excuse me, and they shall become one flesh. Do you remember um, when we were uh, looking at the body a few weeks ago, what we learned when we were studying Genesis 1 and 2? We learned that we are not just bodies only. Neither are we eternal souls with just a temporary body. We are embodied souls. Uh, The human person is the intersection between the spiritual realm and the physical realm in one being. So when two people come together in sex... Don't you see? Sex is not merely physical union between two bodies. Sex is the intersection between one physical spiritual unity with another physical spiritual unity to create a whole new physical spiritual unity. Or we could say it like this. Sex is a radically intimate act of self-giving that involves the whole person. It's a radically intimate act of self-giving that involves the whole person. That's why you can never only give just your body to someone else. To try to give only your body would be like ripping yourself apart, like Voldemort tearing his soul into seven pieces and hiding it in horcruxes. Paul is not saying, never do the one flesh thing because the one flesh thing is bad. Paul is saying, treat the one flesh thing like the sacred act that it is. For instance, uh, you may know that ancient Irish people were very attuned to spiritual reality. They believed that spiritual reality and physical reality were much closer than we normally think. In fact, they had places in Ireland where they believed that um, the distance between spiritual reality and physical reality was what they called tissue paper thin. And they called those places thin places. Places where spiritual reality and physical reality come so close that they overlap. Friends, sex is not merely physical union. It's not merely the satisfaction of a physical appetite or the joining together of two bodies. Sex is a thin place. Paul is not saying, ignore your desires. He's saying, listen to your desires. Because they are telling you something incredibly important about who you are and the nature of ultimate reality. He's saying, pay attention to that. If we really want to understand the true meaning of sex, the first thing we have to do is listen to our desires. But secondly, Paul tells us we need to honor our design. Because as amazing as everything we've just seen is, and it is amazing, 
it still doesn't answer the question, why does the Bible say sex is only for marriage? Well, let's keep going. Remember, Paul is talking about one flesh. He quotes Genesis 2, um, which says that the two will become one flesh. Now, he's talking about human marriage. But then right after that, he says, but anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Now, now Paul's talking about Jesus, and he's saying that the one fleshness of human marriage is actually pointing to being one spirit with Jesus. It means God's desire is to marry us. That's what this means. Friends, this is the biblical frame for sex. In fact, this is the biblical frame for what Christianity is. Think about it. The Bible begins with a marriage in a garden. And all the way at the very end, it ends with the marriage of God and his people. At the very end of the book of Revelation, it says the spirit and the bride, that's you and me, say, come Lord Jesus. The Bible begins and ends with marriage. And then all the way through the Bible, over and over again, in Hebrew scriptures, um, God calls himself the bridegroom of his people. When you get to the gospel accounts of Jesus' life, Jesus calls himself the bridegroom. It's all through the Bible. For instance, in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, he's talking to the church, he says, I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Or in Ephesians 5, he again quotes Genesis 2 where it's talking about one flesh. And he says, this mystery, it's talking about human marriage, but he says this mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Over and over and over again, the Bible says God's desire is to marry us. Friends, it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And by the way, Christopher West says that this is the true biblical picture of sex. It's not starvation. It's not fast food. The true biblical picture of sex is a banquet. That's what God wants for us. In fact, we could say it like this. Here's the big point today. You were designed for spousal union with God. Do you know that's what the message of Christianity is? You were designed for spousal union with God. And not just spousal union... You are designed for exclusive spousal union with God. That's your design. It's what you were made for to be united to God like this. This is one of the most amazing pictures of Christianity. I mean, do you remember the priest's question? What does what you were doing here have to do with the stars? This is the answer. That means that what we do with our bodies, especially sexually, matters. It's not just some spiritual thing. For instance, right before this, Paul says, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. He keeps emphasizing the body. A little later, he says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Your body is a sacred site. When you travel overseas and visit other sacred sites like cathedrals or temples, friends, you will never set foot in a building more sacred than your own body. What we do with our bodies matters. And listen, I understand how weird this sounds in our world, especially for us modern people, because this is a radically different frame or picture of sex. Our culture's frame for sex says that as long as you have consent, you should be able to do whatever you want. Because the most important thing is consent. And, and we think of ourselves as being very enlightened and liberated and progressive because of this. But do you know where our modern ideal of consent comes from have you ever heard of the sexual revolution some of you might say oh yeah that was in the 1960s no i'm actually talking about what many scholars call the first sexual revolution what was that 2000 years ago in ancient rome women were required only to have sex with their husbands but men had all kinds of sexual freedom in roman society men could have sex with prostitutes they could have sex with slaves and they didn't need consent. They could just demand sex with prostitutes, with slaves. In fact, in the ancient world, prostitution basically was sex slavery. There's a historian named Kyle Harper who wrote um, a really um, amazing book called From Shame to Sin. It's all about how Christianity changed the sexual morality of the ancient world. In that book, he's talking about ancient Roman brothels. And he says this, in the brothel, the prostitute's body became little by little like a corpse. 
In the ancient world, sex slavery, forced prostitution was everywhere, and it was brutal. There was no such thing as consent. Because women and slaves were not considered human persons with dignity and rights and the ability to say no or yes. They had no consent. But along comes the Christian church. And it was basically the first Me Too movement. Because the church came into that society and started telling the men, you can't just have sex with whoever you want. You can only have sex with your wife. And even then, between the two of you, there must be consent and dignity and respect inside of that act. Friends, our modern culture gets its whole vision of personal dignity and consent from Christianity. Christianity literally transformed, it revolutionized sexual morality in the ancient world, so much so that within a few hundred years, forced prostitution was outlawed. We get our modern ideal of consent from Christianity. The problem is our culture has turned it into a license to do whatever we want. We just do whatever we want. In fact, what do we say in our culture? Everyone should be free to live however they want as long as they don't harm someone else. The problem is... Um, when we fail to honor our design, God's design for sex, the problem is we do harm ourselves and others. And not only that, um, this whole ideal of consent uh, really isn't helping people. It's, uh, many scholars, many people are pointing out that, uh, especially for women, people do get hurt. Uh, our modern culture says we should be able to do whatever we want. And, and when we do that, we do harm ourselves and we do harm others. And by the way, this is not a new problem. It's an ancient reality. I don't know if you noticed at the very beginning of this passage, uh, Paul quotes uh, what was a, sl a cultural slogan in the ancient world. Everything is permissible for me. This would have been the ancient version of everyone should be free to live however they want. They had their own slogans. Paul is saying, yeah, that may be true, but not everything is beneficial. He's saying, if you pursue freedom, freedom to do whatever you want, you're going to end up harming yourself and others. Not only that, he says, but I will not be mastered by anything. If we just pursue freedom to do whatever we want, then we are going to become slaves of the very thing that we're pursuing. And when we look at our society, we see that, don't we? I mean, sex addiction and pornography are ruining people's lives. Maybe some of yours or people you know. On top of that, um, consent is an incredibly important ethical guideline. It comes from Christianity. But if consent is our only guideline, many contemporary writers, and, and a lot of them are not even Christians, but there, many people are pointing out the reality that if consent is our only guideline, people still get hurt, especially women. So for instance, Liz Brunig is a writer for the Atlantic magazine. She uh, wrote an opinion piece in the um, Washington Post, I think, a few years ago. She says this, the sexual revolution, and she's talking about the 60s here. She said, the sexual revolution made a vast number of previously unavailable sexual choices available. But if we believe that consent itself is the only qualification for a sexual exchange to be good and free, then the most powerful people will always have the upper hand. You hear what she's saying? I, listen, have any of you ever been in a situation where technically there was consent, but something about it didn't feel quite free? And nothing about it felt good? Listen, you know, the last thing I want to do is exacerbate the shame and brokenness that so many of us feel in this area of our lives. One of the best things about the modern sex positivity movement is that it, it is motivated by a desire to remove shame from our lives. That motivation is good. But the strategy of unfettered sexual freedom can never heal our shame. And on top of that, it can never really give us the fulfillment that we're really seeking in sex. Where can we find the, the healing and the redemption and the fulfillment that we're looking for? Well, that leads to our last point. Uh, we've seen that we need to listen to our desires. We need to honor our design. But last, we need to live into our destiny. Um, here's the question. <clears throat> if God's destiny for us, 
excuse me, if God's destiny for us is rapturous, ecstatic, intimate union with God, and it is, then what does that mean for our lives today? This is so, such an important question that in the weeks to come, we're actually going to have a whole sermon on marriage and a whole sermon on singleness. And in fact, you know, I, I know that I haven't even talked about purity culture today, which I'm sure many of you grew up with that. We'll talk about that more as, as we continue. But this morning, let me just um, briefly try to address a few different situations. First, if you're exploring faith in Jesus, it's easy to think, okay, if I become a Christian, then all this stuff about my life has to change, including the, the fact that, what, I can't have sex now? Uh, what if I don't like that? What if I don't agree? What if I don't understand? You know, when I became a Christian, I was 30 years old. Um, I did not grow up going to church. I had no idea what the church taught about this. And I still vividly remember um, the first time somebody explained the Christian sex ethic to me. No sex outside of marriage. I was like, what? <laughs> that made no sense to me. So if you struggle with this aspect of Christianity, believe me, I get it. But here's the thing. When, when you marry someone, you give up your personal freedom to that person. And you do it gladly. Why? Because you fell in love. And now you're willing, your desire to be with this person means more to you than your desire for personal freedom. And so you gladly reorder everything in your life to be with this person that you fell in love with. It's the same thing with Jesus, only more so. In this passage, Paul says, famously, you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. You're not your own. Our culture says you belong to yourself. Jesus says you're not your own. Listen, friends. If the only way that you will give yourself to Jesus is if you are able to retain sexual freedom in your life, then you're not really giving yourself to Jesus. Jesus isn't really your Lord. He's not really your lover. Sexual freedom is. You are going to give yourself to something in this world. And whatever you give yourself to is going to have mastery over you. And if you give yourself utterly like that to anything in this world other than Jesus, then it will enslave you. Jesus is the only Lord and he's the only lover that died in order to make you his own. So if you're exploring faith, I would encourage you, ask the questions. Ask the hard questions. We want to be a church where those questions are um, on the table. And yet at some point, you are going to have to wrestle with the ultimate question, which is, is Jesus Lord or not? Because if he's not Lord, then none of these other questions matter. But if he is Lord, then you can trust him with all the other questions. Second, many of us uh, have parts of our lives that, that are broken. Um, there is shame. There is wreckage in our lives because of sex. And having these conversations is painful. I understand that. And again, I want to be so careful here. But um, uh, for many of us, it's, it's very easy to let the shame and the wreckage and the brokenness kind of define us and write the story of our life. When Paul says that you were bought at a price, friends, that's the language of redemption and healing. Because on the cross, Jesus was ripped apart so that he could be one flesh with you. You know, our lives, what, sexual brokenness and shame can rip us apart but Jesus was ripped apart so he could be one flesh with you on the cross Jesus gave up his independence because he wanted to be with you he wants to marry you so he was literally nailed to a cross so that he could be one flesh with you Jesus lost his dignity he was stripped naked so that he could clothe you with a, a robe of honor and beauty and on the cross Jesus gave his consent to the ultimate assault and violation of his own body so that he could redeem your body, heal your shame, and make you his own. Beautiful, precious, and beloved. Friends, let the cross rewrite the story of your life. And lastly, there are some of you here this morning who are in a place in life um, where you're not sure if it's going to be possible for you to have any kind of sexual fulfillment in this world. 
But listen, whether you're single or whether you're married, please hear me when I say this. Marriage and sexual fulfillment in this world is not, let me repeat, is not the end all be all in this world. When Jesus comes to make all things new, and he will, there is going to be a wedding. There's going to be a marriage. There is going to be a rapturous, ecstatic, erotic, intimate feast of union with Jesus that is going to make the greatest pleasure, sexual pleasure in this world, seem like nothing more than a pat on the back. Live your life today in light of that destiny. It's hard. It's painful. It's challenging. Listen, living our lives with sexual integrity in this world is challenging for all of us. Oftentimes it's going to mean saying no to a desire we have right now in order to say a bigger yes to to our deeper desire for Jesus. Sometimes, maybe even many times, living like this is going to be painful. It's going to be challenging because healing brokenness is painful. If you've ever been to physical rehab, you know exactly what that means. But there is a love and a joy and a beauty that pulls you through the pain. Let me close like this. The Divine Comedy is a long poem by a guy named Dante Alighieri. It's all about a guy who goes through hell, then purgatory, before he finally winds up in the very presence of God. And and as he's um, leaving purgatory, in order to get out of purgatory and get into the presence of God, he has to walk through a wall of fire. And as soon as he sees this thing, he's like, no way. But his guide is a Roman poet named Virgil. And Virgil says, hey, Dante, if you walk through the wall of fire, you'll get to see Beatrice. Beatrice was the love of his life. She died when he was young, but he's never forgotten her. He's never gotten over her. And, and, and he thinks, if I could just see Beatrice again, and, again. In fact, at the very mention of her name, he calls it the name that ever blossoms in my mind. As soon as he hears her name, he's in the fire. But as soon as he steps foot in the fire, he says it was so hot that he would have jumped into a pool of molten glass just to cool off. That's how hot it was. And he doesn't know what he's going to do, and he doesn't really even want to go forward. But Virgil is ahead of him, and Virgil keeps egging him on, saying, hey, I can almost see Beatrice now. I can almost see her eyes. Come on, Dante. So he keeps walking through. It's his desire to see the love of his life that pulls him through the fire. And when he finally does get out of the fire and sees Beatrice, she's even more beautiful than he remembered her. He can't take his eyes off of her. But Jesus is there, and Beatrice can't take her eyes off of Jesus. And the more Dante gazes into Beatrice's eyes, the more he sees Jesus reflected in her eyes. And he says, a thousand times, desires, burning hotter than any flame, bound my eyes to her shining eyes, which were fixed on Jesus. His love for Beatrice was really a deeper love for Jesus. His, her beauty that he was so attracted to, it was really Jesus' beauty that he was looking for. His desire for Beatrice was was really an even deeper desire for Jesus. Friends, listen to your desires. Because the more you listen to them, the, 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 the deeper and the longer you listen to your desires, the more you will realize that they're pointing you to Jesus. Honor your design. You were created. You were designed for intimate, exclusive, spousal union with God. Honor that design in the way you live your lives. And lastly, live into your destiny. There is a greater desire, a greater uh, marriage waiting for us when Jesus comes to make all things new. And yet, living in this world, following Jesus in this world, oftentimes is going to feel like walking through a fire. It's going to be hard and painful and challenging. But not only is Jesus waiting for you at the end of the fire, he's with you in the midst of it right now. Let his love pull you through. Would you pray with me? Abba, we praise you this morning. Our merciful Father, our beautiful Father, our gracious Father, our husband, our spouse, our desire, our love, our ecstasy, our intimacy, 
our rapture. Lord Jesus, you are everything, everything we've ever been desiring in this world. And we praise you and thank you that, that you created us uh, one another to enjoy and experience sexual union in this world as a living embodied picture of the spousal union that we're going to have with you. So we pray this morning that you would help us to live into that destiny, to honor our design, and Holy Father, to listen to our desires so that we might have a truer um, biblical picture, a truer picture of what sex really is, not something bad or dirty that we need to run away from, but something beautiful and glorious that, um, that we can run to. And Lord, for all of us here this morning who have um, shame or brokenness, in our lives because of this. For all of us who we're not even sure what the future holds for us or if, it, or if there's any future in this world for us sexually. Lord, I pray that you would help us to fix our eyes more and more to Jesus because there is a marriage, there is a wedding, there is an intimacy that is waiting for all of us who follow Jesus and we look forward to that, Lord, and we pray that you will help us to set our hearts and our eyes on that for we pray all of these things in Jesus' name, amen.